committee of the whole meeting of Monday, June 4th, 2018. The court call roll, please. Mayor Berman? Here. Trustee Cavino? Here. Trustee Lowry? Here. Trustee Chris? Here. Mr. Carroll? Here. Mr. Martinez? Here. Mr. Gaby? Here. Uh, we have one item for discussion this evening. Uh, the way that we're going to work this, we'll have uh, E.R. Horton uh, make their presentation. I think uh, staff will make a presentation. Uh, we'll explain everything that's happened up to that point in time. And uh, then the board can discuss. I guess before the board discuss, we'll have uh, audience comments. So that's the way we'll roll. Uh, so our discussion item, Mr. Toth. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce D.R. Horton and them to come up and give a presentation tonight. And I'll follow up with a brief PowerPoint presentation as well. Okay, <coughs> Just speak into the mic. That's all. Good evening. Is this close enough? Good. Uh, my name is Mark Fields. I'm with D.R. Horton. Uh, I have had the uh, privilege of being in front of you a couple of times uh, in, in this type of setting. And I uh, look forward to being back again tonight to kind of walk through uh, some of the revisions, uh, some of the enhancements uh, and revised proposal uh, that is in front of you this evening. Um, would like to just quickly introduce, uh, I am joined tonight by our consultant team. Uh, many of them will uh, have familiar faces. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jerry Shane with Shane Banks has joined us tonight, as well as uh, WBK uh, on our land planning, SimCon, uh, working on our site engineering, uh, Gary Weber Associates as our landscape architect, as, as well as the joint fire traffic consultants this evening. Just a brief uh, kind of history. It's hard to believe that we're approximately a, a year uh, from our first uh, time uh, kind of doing the pre application meeting and uh, kind of kicking off the process to where we are today. Um, there has been some significant uh, change, involvement in, in, I think, what we originally uh, came in front of the, uh, the, the village to propose. Uh, and we are excited again to, to be back in front of you this evening uh, to answer questions, to kind of show you how some of the uh, things have evolved in, 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 the, pro in the process, in, in the detail, and, and getting to kind of a closer to finished product and proposal. Uh, just to some brief introductory, all, we, we all know where the site is located, uh, off of Route 25, just uh, east of the Fox River. And what we have proposed is an active adult community, a, uh, a community that is providing uh, what we would call an active lifestyle uh, to, to a buyer who, who chooses to live in an environment uh, with a large community center place of destination. Um, just some highlights, and I know I've said this before, but, uh, but what is an active buyer? What does that mean uh, when an independent buyer chooses a lifestyle? And well, what they're looking for is proximity to shopping, proximity to natural uh, cultural attractions within, within the area, quality medical facilities, uh, and, 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 and largely low maintenance living, you know, kind of a privacy of home ownership. Uh, combined without necessarily the obligations for uh, you know day-to-day -day maintenance, seasonal maintenance. Um, some of the main I, you know, items that you've seen or have progressed within our, our uh, application have been some of the on-site activities, uh, the open space, the enlargement of, of that percentage of open space, uh, the uh, inclusion of a clubhouse, lakes, walking paths, uh, and a combination of active and passive parks. And together, you know, these types of amenities combined with a product uh, really drive this uh, low maintenance age, uh, you know, active adult type of community where residents uh, can, new residents can come into town, uh, but, but really predominantly trying to keep existing residents, providing them with opportunities within the village of North Aurora uh, to, to be able to stay, stay local, uh, live local, uh, continue to be around family uh, involvement in their, their churches and their community organizations. Uh, and we pull it all together, uh, the, the lifestyle, the product, the amenities, uh, to really develop, like I said, a, a sense of a destination point, a, a true community that's uh, you know, different than, than a lot of what we see in traditional housing, traditional neighborhoods. 
I do want to take a minute, and I'm going to hand over uh, kind of the center part of the presentation to Adam Rack. Uh, Adam is with WBK, our land planner. He's going to walk through, again, some uh, refreshers on where we've been in the past, as well as highlight some of the changes that have occurred uh, since our last plant commission hearing. Um, and again, kind of the involvement of the plan, working with staff, uh, working with, with the village to uh, get to a point where we are uh, back in front of you this evening. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to stand at this podium so that I can see this right here. Um, as Mark said, my name is Adam Rack from WBK Engineering, for the land planning consultants for the property. Uh, we are proposing as part of uh, our package tonight a zoning map amendment. As you can see, on the left uh, is the village's current zoning ordinance, which identifies the property as R1. Uh, on the right is, is our proposed uh, configuration, which is a mixture of R1A, R3, and R4. As you can see, uh, to the east, uh, we are compatible with the existing R1. There's uh, a strip of R3 to the south, which aligns with what we are proposing as well in the southeast corner. Uh, and in addition, uh, we are proposing the R4 to the southwest corner along Route 25. So, uh, all in all, we're proposing uh, very compatible land use with the existing zoning designation. Um, as most people will remember, we've been forward, uh, been forth with uh, many different site plan iterations. We won't spend too much time talking about those. Uh, so, one that you will remember, and actually that we're reacting to today, was uh, a very straight grid, grid-like configuration. Uh, we got great feedback working with you all, uh, as well as planning commission, uh, working with staff uh, uh, to come up with a site plan that we've actually grown quite fond of and we're very excited about and, and uh, looking forward to for presenting with you tonight. Next slide. Next, please. It's going to take a minute because there's a lot going on. Uh, as you can see, the site plan uh, design is really driven by the land itself. Uh, water and drainage is a key component of this site plan. There's a significant drainage way indicated by the blue arrows, uh, obviously entering the site at Banbury, uh, spreading down towards Route 25, uh, obviously draining and outlining towards the river. Uh, we uh, uh, let that kind of be the driving force behind our site plan uh, that locates our stormwater retention areas, primarily located along uh, uh, Route 25. Uh, and then in addition, we wanted to make sure those were kind of showcased as, as real amenities for the property. So we kind of encased those and, and defined our neighborhoods using those greenways and, and kind of making those the central features of the property. Next slide, please. We then uh, introduced a, a street network. As you can see, uh, we are now proposing a, a very curvilinear street network, much more in line with what is more common in the village. Uh, we have aligned to the north, uh, east, we have aligned the uh, proposed entrance with Oakcrest Drive, and we're proposing a single curb cut along Route 25, uh, essentially located along the Route 25 uh, frontage, and then we have one uh, to the southeast, uh, and the proposed curb cut along Banbury as well. And the north part of the site's uh, proposed zoning of R1A is our single family portion of the site. Uh, we have 149 units in this location. Uh, we are also, um, obviously there's a, a ring road around the perimeter of the project, and then we are also proposed an uh, interconnected grid of curvilinear streets. Next one. Uh, to the southeast corner, or the southeast quadrant of the property, is our deep lot. lot. We're proposing 126 units, uh, 85 foot lot width by 120 feet deep. Next please. And then the R4 portion of the property along Route 25 is our townhome section. What's unique about the townhome section is the configuration uh, around the centrally uh, access parking court, which creates an alternating condition of parking court and then courtyard on the opposite side. So some of the units in there are really fronting these uh, kind of attractive and intimate uh, courtyard areas that are attractive to the landscape that we can show uh, in the landscape plan later on. Uh, what this does, uh, this configuration organizes these plans around these parking courts. It, it prevents us from having long and monotonous facades uh, of front-facing garages along the streets. So it puts the side and the short edge of the building uh, uh, along the street and, and, again, providing some more variety along the street. So, uh, originally, we proposed a single loaded sidewalk condition. Uh, based on some of the comments we received from you all and, and from staff, we were encouraged to incorporate sidewalks on both sides of the street, uh, and we have uh, shown that here in red. 
we then uh, supplemented uh, the sidewalk connectivity throughout the neighborhood with a series of naturalized uh, trails and paths. Uh, and those will be uh, traveling throughout kind of our landscape, present or landscape nature areas uh, and, amen and really uh, become an amenity for the, the property. Thanks. This is the final uh, view of the site actually starts to fill in some of the landscaping. Uh, we do have a landscape plan which we'll talk about uh, shortly. Uh, but what we have here is really a series of three distinct neighborhoods, the R1A single family, the R3 duplex, and the R4 townhome, uh, that are kind of defined by these natural areas where we really feel there's a strong amenity for this property. Next slide. Uh, the landscape plan is shown here. Uh, we are proposing approximately an additional 1,200 trees in addition to the trees that are going to, or that we hope to save uh, in, the pro in the project. Um, based on some of the comments we, see, we received from Planning Commission, we did add some additional uh, evergreen trees, which was the preference of Planning Commission, along the north, east, and south buffers. Um, I think the next slide will talk yeah, the buffer areas. Um, the buffer areas are, are unique to this project in that we kind of took a strategy to, to plant those based on the existing condition of the buffer. Uh, as you can see, the unique buffer along Route 25 it is defined by uh, the attractive detention basins. That is a required buffer of 50 feet uh, to Route 25. So we've also uh, maintained as many trees as we could in that area based on grading. We will maintain as many based on uh, grading requirements. And then uh, begin to supplement some of those plantings along Route 25. The 40-foot uh, buffer along Banbury is existing plantings. Uh, to be honest, the plantings there are, some are in good shape, some are not. Uh, there is some plantings in the right of way as well. Um, the, the plantings that are saved will be continue to be maintained by the village, and then we will then supplement some of those plantings to provide a, a strong, stronger buffer along Banbury uh, on the common areas behind the lots. Uh, back, sorry, not that yet. The orange indicates the buffer along the north. We are proposing a 30-foot uh, buffer, which again is not required by the ordinance, uh, but that is 30 feet from our property line to the rear lot lines of those buildings there. There's an additional 30 feet uh, rear yard setback, so in essence a 60-foot total buffer uh, from uh, to the north between the rear of our buildings and our lot lines. Uh, and the same goes for the south. There's a 24-foot buffer with an additional, uh, I believe, 25 rear yards and those areas for those town homes. Um, next slide. This is uh, can, yes. I ask, can you specify which which page here you're in? Uh, that is on that's in the presentation. So okay, so it's not in it should the buffer should be in that exactly. Okay. Yeah. Here's the buffer. This exhibit, and we do have uh, cross sections for, for all the buffers. Uh, this one, uh, and for brevity's sake, we decided just to show it to the north. As you can see, a single family lot number 28, which is shown generally in the area of uh, the section line AA. Uh, we have a proposed 30 foot minimum rear yard from the rear of the lot to the rear property line. We have an additional 30 foot landscape buffer in that area, so essentially 60 feet from the rear, uh, home, rear of the home to the property uh, perimeter property line. We're then showing uh, plus or minus 55 feet, which is actually the minimum distance between uh, the adjacent residence rear lot line uh, to the existing homes. So we have essentially a, a minimum of 115 feet of buffer between the homes on our property to the existing to the north. Uh, now I'm going to bring Mark Fields back up and he's going to tell you a little bit more about the community clubhouse and then we'll have the presentation of the So as this plan uh, and proposal has evolved, uh, one of the items uh, that we are now able, I think, to provide a little more clarity and more detail on uh, is the actual community clubhouse and amenity area. Um, in, in weeks past, uh, those have all been in kind of development, and, and all we, although we knew that the importance of creating 
uh, right, this this focal point within the community, um, getting to the point of working drawings and some concepts and some layouts. Uh, again, has been part of the involvement of, of the project over the last few weeks. And so I wanted to touch just, just briefly on, on this portion specifically. Um, we've highlighted in kind of the reddish-orange color uh, what I will refer to as kind of the out parcel or the clubhouse community parcel. Um, on the next slide, it'll, it'll give you a, a little greater detail of just the layout of that space and, and what does that include. Obviously, uh, guest parking, um, a proposed pool, uh, the clubhouse itself, some outdoor space that you'll see with the pergola, uh, the pickleball, the bocce, um, as well as making sure that we're uh, being sensitive to uh, proposed future residents uh, that would be adjacent to the clubhouse and site. So providing you know additional screening, additional plantings, uh, again, to create not only that uh, focal destination as you come up the main entrance uh, and kind of got the grade change from the river up to this uh, higher point where, where this clubhouse will kind of be sitting up on the hill. Um, so again, providing uh, what, what I would call right, some of the underlying um, uh, really drivers to what this buyer is looking for in, in this sense of community sense uh, it is really having a usable space uh, that has amenities and activities uh, that, that they can really you know, take part of as a part of their uh, HOA news and, and just again as a part of the general community. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, again, we're proposing uh, our concept elevation. Again, kind of keeping theme with some of the area, uh, some traditional architecture, uh, blend of different roof pitches, uh, uh, different siding, some stone, some vinyl, uh, some nice roof details. Again, as far as uh, enhanced uh, landscaping, uh, to again really be a true highlight as as you come home as as a, as a resident comes into this community uh, to really define that open space and and uh, again that kind of part of the hilltop that, that will shine per se to to drivers coming up and down Route 25, but obviously the draw to come into a, a neighborhood, an age targeted community uh, that, that really provides a, sta a substantial space for, for their activities. Um, the next slide is uh, more of a general floor plan, uh, but again, just to highlight a few of the uh, uses that this uh, this type of amenity clubhouse would, would have uh, some office space, uh, what we would call some flex spaces. Some of those are community rooms, some of those are used for HOA, some of those are used for private parties, for, for events, uh, as well as storage for things like mechanicals, pool storage, uh, outdoor furniture storage, um, a combination of both uh, men's and women's restrooms, uh, along with a, a movement studio and kind of a fitness area. So again, uh, a nice combination. Uh, the amenity would, would also have what I'm going to call a, uh, a warming kitchen, so it's not a full functioning commercial kitchen, but it does pro provide the ability uh, you know, for people to host gatherings, uh, bring in uh, food, keeping it warm, warmers. Uh, similar similarities to what you might see uh, in, in a church, uh, church type of building, uh, where it's not a full commercial kitchen, but it does provide uh, the opportunity to host events that would require where, where residents could, could use that. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I, one other, one other mention. Uh, we're proposing it's, it's about a roughly 6,000 square foot clubhouse. Um, that you know that may go up a little bit again as they kind of define uh, some of the required storage areas um, and, and really dive into a few specifics just related to sprinkler rooms. Uh, I can see that overall uh, square footage growing a little bit uh, right now. The proposal is roughly 6,000 square feet. I also just want to briefly highlight again, uh, you know, the product discussion as we, we've talked has been relatively uh, relatively the same as it's progressed. Uh, the ranch home product we're proposing, uh, again, what we would call our Freedom Series home, uh, ranging from 1,600 square foot to almost 2,200 square foot. Uh, all of these will be a two bedroom, two bath standard, some of them with options that uh, have the ability to grow to three bedrooms. Uh, similarly, they all have some sort of patio space, uh, and those are standard to the product. Uh, so some of those are covered spaces, in fact, the majority of them uh, are a covered patio. And then there are a handful of plans that do have an exposed patio option. The next slide will show the uh, proposed duplex homes. Again, similarly, uh, uh, square footage is ranging from 1,400 to over 1,500 square feet. Um, these products are a two-bedroom, two-bath, and again, all have uh, 
both, both, both products do have a covered patio as a standard. The third proposed home is uh, what we refer to either as a triplex villa or a townhome, um, again ranging from 1,200 square foot to, uh, uh, to, to just over 1,400. Again, uh, two bedroom, two bath options. One plan does have a three bedroom option. Um, all of these would have an exposed patio. And so some of the interesting parts of this product and how it works together, uh, it allows us to serve a, a buyer profile uh, ranging from uh, you know, 1,200 square feet on the low end to uh, you know, over 22, 2,300 square feet uh, as, you, as you move into the detached single family portion. Um, the other part of the product that I always like to highlight is some of the variation of the rear exteriors with exposed patios and covered patios. As we looked at the site plan as it's kind of evolved, uh, showing that open space and, and the majority of the lots, whether single family, whether attached, do back up to a green board or some type of open space. So not only are we getting some uh, interest in the streetscape side of, of the architecture, but on the rears of the homes, uh, with the landscaping, the hardscaping, uh, as well as the mixture of, of covered patios, exposed patios, uh, it really does create for a nice, diverse feeling uh, when you're driving through a neighborhood that you've got both front and rear interest in, in some of those details. The next slide, please. Uh, you can go back one. Um, so this is kind of our, our end slide, so to speak. We do have some supplemental uh, in the event there are questions that, that are asked uh, so that we can further, uh, I think, you know, get into answers uh, and do that. Um, I do just want to mention, uh, like I said earlier, it's been you know, just shy of a year as we've gotten to this point in the process and working with staff, taking direction, uh, feedback that we received from this body as well as the plan commission. Uh, really hope that so what you have seen is, is our efforts into trying to get to a point uh, of taking all of the feedback and trying to mold it and put it into a revised package uh, that, that ho hopefully gets you excited for the possibility of, of this neighborhood in, in, in the village. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's worth highlighting, and I know that Mike will touch on this, uh, as we did uh, work through the process and we've kind of gotten uh, to this step, uh, I, I feel excited that we've, that we've really been able to address, uh, if not 100%, uh, all of the comments that have been received, as well as hopefully maybe providing some sort of uh, compromise situations when we couldn't fully agree or had some, some challenges getting there. Uh, but, but I do hope that you've seen, you know, obviously the progression from a site plan, uh, the loss of density from where we started at over 400 units to where we are today, uh, really a commitment to grow open space, uh, provide for a high quality amenity, and, and really striving to, to generate or, or build excitement for, for Lincoln Valley on the Fox, you know, a true destination, an age-targeted community uh, to help, again, establish residents local, but, but really also uh, provide opportunities to bring new residents as so I appreciate your time. I look forward to your questions. Um, I believe Mike is going to go through his presentation at this point. Thank you. Are you making him uh, move out there later? <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question for you. How many residents are you looking at? I mean, is the approximate number that uh, this is? 362. 362. 362. Yes, as of right now, it's proposed to be 374 units total. So that will transfer and uh, density of like part of the I'm actually going to tap on that. Okay. 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 Okay.
All right, a little bit about why we're here tonight. Um, the property itself, which everyone knows the location, is the Florida Rapids Valley Golf Course, is jurisdictional North Aurora. It's within our planning boundaries, but it is actually owned by the city of Aurora. So as of right now, this, the petitioner or the developer is under contract with the city um, to close on the property pending the outcome of the zoning discussion. Um, and again, they are petitioning a PAP amendment, which is rezoning the property, which is currently on R1 to the R1A to accommodate the single family homes, R3 to accommodate the duplexes, and R4 for the townhomes. They're also requesting the special use uh, for the planned unit development. It's actually required by code as it is two acres, in, uh, two acres plus in size and various departures within the subdivision ordinance and zoning ordinance, which is made part of the PUD, um, and included in the PUD ordinance. A little history. Um, this started uh, last year um, at, the, at the committee level with the development committee on September 20th. The plan that was presented then included a total of 400 units. Um, the, the development committee at that time was okay with the concept itself, uh, but felt that too, but 400 units was too dense. Um, so we had gone back to the drawing board uh, previous to going for the um, Committee of the Whole on November 6, 2017. I just want to make note too that starting with the second draft, the first draft was actually presented to staff. Uh, staff took a look at it. It was a very grid pattern uh, layout design subdivision. Uh, we we had actually highly recommended that they go back to the drawing board, which they had done and before going to the development committee, and that was the result of the second draft plan. So moving forward to the community as a whole was the third draft plan. And that plan kind of highlighted the, the, the next major step in the direction of the plan itself. It included the amenities, the walking trail, um, sidewalks on both sides, more of a linear, uh, curve linear uh, subdivision pattern design, which um, Adam had presented earlier. The, the actual concept plan was well received by the village board. Um, that plan included 362 units. Now, the plan before us tonight includes 374. The additional 12 units were um, duplex units um, located in the southeast quadrant there. And doing the calculations in open space, it equated to about a, a, about a total of 7,000 square feet of impervious surface. So um, very, very minor in comparison to um, what was discussed previous to that. Now, on March 6th of this year, the plan went, the plan went before the plan commission, which was the fourth draft plan. Now, that plan included the 374 units. Um, and that meeting itself was very heavily attended by the public. Uh, there were a lot of concerns that were addressed at that meeting. Um, it was, we had quite a substantial uh, out there, turnout for that crowd. Um, the meeting itself went about four hours, so a lot of good feedback from that uh, meeting. Again, the, the Planning Commission meetings minutes are included in your packet for tonight uh, for review, and those were approved by the Planning Commission. And, the Planning Commission did recommend approval of the petition. Um, when I say petition, I mean the special use for the plan unit development, the map amendment, and the plenary subdivision plan, um, basically under eight conditions. And it is worth noting, too, that staff actually did recommend approval of the petition itself uh, prior to the Planning Commission hearing. Just a general outline of some of the um, topics that were discussed, uh, traffic impacts, a lot of discussion on Danbury Road, speeding, uh, additional traffic on the the um, road itself. Um, there were a lot of concerns about Banbury Road uh, heading north of 25 intersection there. Um, age targeted versus age restricted development. Again, this is not an age restricted development, meaning there aren't covenants that require 55 and older. Uh, being age targeted, which is uh, which Mark would explain earlier, is more by design. Um, community driven amenities, first floor masters, uh, more of an active community adjacent to shopping um, and healthcare. But, a lot of what came up that discussion when I mentioned that is there were um, concerns from area residents regarding the density of it, meaning that if it wasn't age restricted, that uh, any family could move in at that point. Uh, stormwater impacts that was discussed as well. Um, the impacts of the stormwater not on the hill itself, but as it pertains to uh, development to the to the north and to the south. Um, as, as Adam's uh, illustration depicted earlier, the actual water does flow from east to west towards the river. And there were actually some concerns discussed too about how this would impact the park across the street and how that water were to flow across 25. Um, density was discussed, uh, the number of units and their configuration and the, the tightness of the development um, as far as uh, subdivision sort of layout. Uh, building facade appearance and maintenance. Uh, basically looking at the, the materials of the buildings themselves um, being of lesser, um, lesser quality. Um, but uh, one of the other concerns was maintenance of the actual buildings themselves. 
uh, making sure that if this was to be built, that would be oversight um, through maintenance agreements. Uh, buffer and green space, um, obviously this is a very major concern considering it's 100 acres of open space right now. Um, and then how the, the development itself would impact surrounding uh, neighborhoods to the south, to the north, um, and to the east itself. So maybe a major part of the discussion. Uh, tree preservation, the property is littered with uh, mature trees. Um, and I believe that the, the impetus of the development is to preserve the majority of these trees. Uh, but that was mentioned um, at the public hearing. And it's been mentioned uh, from the, the inception of the plan itself that it is a real uh, asset and a value to the community and to the area to preserve as many trees as possible. And some concerns about wildlife displacement um, should the property develop. At the meeting, there were discussions about uh, traffic impacts. And one of the um, items that was discussed was the, the traffic study itself. Um, so what had happened was one of the conditions of approval that additional traffic study was done. So staff actually reached out to KLOA Inc. to have this, to have this um, additional uh, traffic counts conducted, but also to looking at the methodology and the um, traffic report from the first group. Uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Javier Milan from KLOA, just kind of summarize the, the results of the traffic study that was done after the plan commission public hearing. Good evening. Uh, my name is Javier Milan. I'm a senior consultant of KLOA Incorporated. Graduated in 1995 from Marquette University with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering, concentration in traffic and transportation. Worked for about four years in construction of Wisconsin DOT. And then moved down here and I've been uh, practicing as a traffic engineer for 19 years. Uh, we're also, uh, our company is also the village consultant for other municipalities. In my case, I uh, handle the village of Lombard. Uh, so as Michael mentioned, we, uh, we were requested to review the traffic study. And as requested by the village staff, uh, part of that traffic study was to conduct additional counts. Uh, we counted on two separate days. Uh, that was Tuesday, April 10th, and uh, Wednesday, April 11th. The times were expanded a little bit. If you remember, the traffic counts in the morning were six to nine. One of the things we noticed is, given the existence of the school and the close proximity, we felt that the counts in the afternoon should have started earlier, just to see the impact of the school in the area. So we counted from two to seven p.m. Uh, again, the school was in session. I made sure the school was in session, and there were a bunch of activities happening on the days of the counts uh, after school hour activities. So based on the traffic counts, the peak hours in the area are from 7 to 8 in the morning, 3 to 4. You can see that that's kind of like the school peak, even though they have you know, dismissed the children, you still have activity, <coughs> things are happening. And then 5 to 6, which is typically what you see as the commuter peak hour, people coming back uh, home from work. So once we collected that data, we looked at it, and we compared it with the previous data. How was it compared? So, the traffic rollers were within 2 and 10 percent of the counts that were conducted on behalf of, uh, of the airport. So a difference of 2 to 10 percent is within, you know, uh, uh, it's typical and it's normal. Why do I say this? You can find intersection every single day and you're going to have some fluctuation. If you have a fluctuation of 50 percent, something went wrong. But again, you can count every day the same intersection, you're going to get different numbers. We also review the trip generation. They do a proper trip generation for this. Uh, the distribution, the assignment of traffic. So we went through all of their methodology and we, in essence, concurred with their findings and methodology. Uh, we also looked, as Michael mentioned, as the amount of traffic that, based on their projections and their assignment, that would be seen to the north of Banbury. And again, uh, taking into consideration you're going to have traffic going north, but also traffic coming from the north. That basically adds about 2.8, I'm oh sorry, one additional trip every 2.8 or 2.2 minutes during the morning and the peak hour. What do I mean? In the morning, you have people going northbound, you might have a few cars that are coming southbound. Uh, by the same token, from the south, you basically will experience approximately 1.2 or 1.5 additional vehicles every minute during the morning and the afternoon or evening peak hour. Uh, Based on the geometry of the roads and the capacity analysis, uh, this additional traffic can be accommodated without changing any of the uh, characteristics or patterns of the road. 
So in summary, as I say, that you know we, we looked at everything that they did uh, in terms of methodology, uh, analysis, and findings, and we are in general agreement with concurrence. And we run our own analysis, and we <coughs> think the proposed development can be accommodated by the roadways, uh, assuming the improvements that they <coughs> mentioned in the traffic study. As you know, there's a proposed level lane, lane on our Route 25. Uh, I want to mention this, the state actually reviewed their traffic study and they concur also with their analysis and they're in agreement with providing the correct domain on Route 25. Any questions? I'll more than happy to answer that. Thanks, Javier. Go ahead and um, I don't know if um, perhaps Chief, uh, have you estimated if uh, the addition of this subdivision would perhaps impact the number of uh, deputies and staff uh, uh, police officers that we have in order to maintain you know, proper uh, surveillance in the... You know, not, not at this point yet. I mean, um, I've thought about it, but it, it'll, I'll have to kind of wait to see A, if it goes in, and B, uh, how many residents it looks like it's going to add in all. In all, I mean, we know how many units there are proposed, but I don't know how many you know residents. If you just take that and double it, or you know what what the factor is, but um, I I have considered it. Yes. In the ground line, if we we're adding 300, 400, 300, and however, this my question was going earlier. You know, it, it sounds like everything sounds beautiful, and it has a great plan. But um, as um, my concern is, with the growing activity in all throughout the United States, with uh, you know violence, obviously we want to keep our neighborhoods, our, our kids, our, our families all nice and safe, in addition to just traffic. So I uh, I would like to make sure that perhaps you, you can consult your chief and, uh, and see if if if, uh, if this is going to make an impact and uh, uh, the number of staff members that you count on uh, and uh, we will be able to perhaps um, make sure that all of our community is uh, it's in a uh, uh, protected safe and uh, now or while um, is that okay? Yeah. Chief? Yeah, oh absolutely. That's definitely something to consider, um, you know, as, as the whole package. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kind of moving forward, um, I want to reiterate too that the, prop the property is actually zone R1. This was brought up at the public hearing as well. It's kind of just kind of wrapping our brains around what that means. Um, the R1 is the single family residence district. North Road does not have an open space zoning designation, uh, but again, it is R1, which allows single family homes by right. And what we did, we asked Tescan Associates to do an estimate of the number of single family homes that could fit onto this property. Um, and if you look at the diagram here, it's a sketch um, taking into consideration some of the detention areas um, that outline the current development um, and using the existing set setbacks, lot width, letter, and minimums for the R1 district. Um, it was estimated that it could be about 230 homes um, in this subdivision by right, um, which would include a gross density of 2.2 units per acre. And based upon the U.S. Census count for persons per household at 2.86, um, approximately 658 residents. And again, that 2.86 from the Census Bureau that takes consideration all housing types and it's an average of the community. How would district itself? Um, the one I would just go ahead and do is list the, the, the permitted uses and the special uses included in the district. Um, I did this to show that again, single families permitted use, uh, special uses, this include a golf course um, and also planned unit development. And the planned unit development uh, by special use affords the anyone at that point in time to come forward and um, make a request to do so. And in that capacity, ask for reductions in setbacks, uh, bulk regulations, yard regulations as well. Um, if a use is not shown as permitted or a special use, which town reflects is not, um, it is considered a prohibited use. And because it's prohibited, um, that is, that's the emphasis for the request for going for the, the R1 to the R3 and R4 to accommodate the duplexes and townhomes. Uh, a little bit more about density. I know that some of the trustees had asked this question tonight. I just want to kind of highlight that. Um, the gross density for the development itself is about 3.65 units per acre. Now, the gross density takes into consideration the entirety of the property, 102 acres, and the number of units. Um, it's pretty simple math. 
The net density, what we did in this area, was break out the individual um, areas, meaning the R1A area, the R3 and R4, and we were left with a net density of 7.92 um, units per acre. Um, according to the developer and the, the um, submissions and the plan reports, the about 50% of the development will be dedicated to open space, stormwater retention, and right of way. Uh, right of way meaning sidewalks and streets. The village doesn't have a specific density uh, requirement. Instead, we rely on our volume yard regulations, our, our setbacks, our lot width minimums, our lot area requirements to kind of arrive on a um, actual density for development itself. Um, looking at typical densities in the lower right hand corner, that's ex that was extrapolated from the American Planning Association's typical gross densities. And you can see um, for single family detached between 4 to 10. Um, single family row homes, um, each 20, and then each 25 for three to six family houses. Um, so you can tell that they're well within that uh, parameter as well. Um, also, too, we pulled the, some North War examples on uh, the bottom left. Um, that actually is not a country called the state, but it should be country of Highland States, which is located uh, south of Fairway View, um, country club being to the east of this development. Uh, their gross acreage is um, excuse me, gross density 1.9 uh, by units per acre. And looking at Randall Highlands, which is located in Randall and Orchard, uh, which includes a mixture of commercial, um, it also includes single family homes and town homes. They arrived on a, a density of estimated about 3.89 units per acre. The zoning, the zoning and subdivision departure, which is included in the PUD amendment, is exhibit to that. Um, sort of, it lists the request made by the petitioner. Um, each of these counts is broken down into separate zoning districts. You have the R1A single family, the R3 uh, general residence district to accommodate the duplexes, and the R4 to accommodate the townhomes. The actual standard or what the code requires for each district is, in the, is the center column, to the left of what is proposed, and to the right of the departure. Again, the R1A, the R3, and R4 are currently all existing uh, zoning districts within the North Ward Zone Ordinance. Uh, there are also, also some, there are also some that are in the subdivision ordinance. Um, Cul-de-sac length links, um, some requirements for um, street light distances, and um, many of which they've been. We'll kind of go through that as the uh, to proceed here. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there were eight conditions that came from the Planning Commission as conditions of approval. Now, staff had one, which was the alignment of the Oak Crest intersection, which we're currently working on right now for the engineering plans. Um, I'll just kind of go through this really quick. Uh, the first one being the additional traffic study. Um, that was actually completed by KOA, and as Javier really just went through the information. The um, second condition was additional evergreen trees in the buffer area. As Adam explained in the landscape plan, that there were additions of uh, evergreen trees to each of the buffer areas. Um, number three was a tree preservation plan. The subdivision ordinance has a tree preservation plan, uh, but we wanted to kind of just memorialize this in the PUD as well, so it was not lost in the time as, as we proceed. Um, codes can change, we wanted to memorialize this in the PUD itself. Um, so basically, if any trees are removed or damaged during the demolition or the development of the property itself, um, there's not a fine in place, but it's to be replaced as a, as a similar caliber. And if, and if there's a large tree that that cannot be accommodated for, um, it would have to be um, done in kind of with a similar uh, number of caliber trees. So if one tree is, um, is 12 inches in diameter and says knocked down, it would be replaced by six 2 inch diameter trees. Um, this is what the map allows. Um, so that way, each each is accounted for when it comes to a replacement. Um, one of the plan commissioners um, recommended that the Sussex Court, which is the southernmost street, that western leg there, which goes into a cul-de-sac, uh, being one of the subdivision departures, is longer than what the, what the code allows. Um, so they wanted to go from 30 feet to 33 feet to allow for additional um, road right of way for emergency vehicles, um, which the petitioner has obliged and has shown in the plan set tonight and included in the packet. Um, the one condition, the one condition of approval number five um, that was not agreed upon by the petitioner uh, was going from the uh, R1A setback of five feet to the R1 setback of 10 feet. Now there's just there's some illustrations in the packet tonight that kind of depict some of these sites of setbacks. Um, Ten feet is what the R1 currently requires. They're requesting R1A, which is an existing zoning district, at uh, five feet. Um, they, they've set the minimum five feet according to discussions with the petitioner that uh, those will fluctuate. It would be a minimum of five, so we're expecting between five and seven feet. So you could expect uh, between 10 and 14 feet between each single family structure or these structures in the development. 
Um, the distance number six is the distance between the street lights. Um, must be provided and approved by the village engineer. Included in the packet is a, uh, after the meeting, the petitioner went ahead and created the street lighting exhibit. There's only one portion of the street light exhibit that um, actually exceeds the 250 feet. Um, so that was the one instance, and we reviewed that. Um, and did that be, looking back at the plan, that was just for um, lack of redundancy in the street lights itself. And number, moving on to number seven, was that the street lights be deployed in technology. Um, they agreed to that and will move forward as, as a requirement that all the lights in the subdivision utilize LED technology. Um, lastly, was that the PUD uh, pay an impact fee of $715 per unit uh, for the uh, land cash fee for the fire district. Anytime a property annexes into the village of North Florida, they pay an impact fee of $715 per unit to the fire district. Um, in this case, the property is already annexed into the village, so the $715 is not required, uh, but to assist with future capital planning and offsets of the burden uh, from the development up front, uh, the developer has agreed to pay the $715 per unit to the fire district. Hey, Mike, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Uh, uh, the number three of that plan commission conditions, you're saying that the PUD or staff's recommending that the PUD vary from what the existing ordinance is that, that assesses a fine if the trees are Correct, and I apologize. What's in here is different than the PUD. If you look at the PUD, the language does not include a fine system. The, the language in the PUD includes a strict, uh, it's a per caliber uh, remedy for any trees that were, that were damaged. We wanted to get away from the fine system because um, we wanted to make sure that any loss of tree or vegetation on the property remained in the area and wasn't displaced um, elsewhere in the village. Is there any requirement that uh, those replaced trees have to be in the same geographic location or within a certain area? Like if a big 50 year old old tree is damaged or destroyed or killed, does it have to be in the same area or can it just be added to a berm? On the other side of the development, it could be it could be dispersed the way it's currently written. Um, it leaves its open for interpretation at that point, um, because within the design, if you have a large cut tree, replacing it with, with several smaller cut trees might be more difficult. But it could be dispersed throughout the development. But again, these are conditions of approval that came from the planning commission. As, as I'll as I'll know later, any condition that's from the planning commission um, can be removed. You can add additional conditions if you want. Um, but I'll look into that. To me, that's not really a fair trade-off. You want to take it out on 40-inch oak tree and replace them with, you know, whatever that is, 15 three-inch trees. Or to me, I like the fine system because I think people on their machines and um, you know, the operators out there and whatnot that it just doesn't seem like there's much uh, concern. You know what I mean? Like, you have to, you know, pay ten thousand dollars or something for, and that's. The beauty of this property is the trees. I mean, one of the things of it, and people live on a bridge. You know, I mean, that's something that I'm sure they want to save and uh, have. So, you know, I'm not comfortable with that language. So I'd like to see something for. I agree with that. Okay. Is that a fine? We're going to be a little more careful with that. Yeah. You're just going to put three trees somewhere else, and be like, you know, this is in the way. We'll knock it down, and we'll put some trees on the north end. So something, something, uh, something a little different than, than that. Okay, yeah, if it does move move forward, if it's if it's um, pretty common, we can certainly to add that as uh, part of the PUD. I think when we get to that point, that's what's important to remember is that just because something's in front of you doesn't mean it has to be approved the way it's in front of you. You have the right to change it, alter it, add, remove. So those are good things for the report to discuss tonight. Now, the red PUD, which is included in the packet tonight, um, I just want to provide a summation. This would be the actual document that would come before the board um, should be decided to move forward with the development um, and its approval. Um, the, it's the last document um, aside from the development plans, and it's the map amendment and special use for the BUD ordinance. Um, this is the document that has um, been in discussion back and forth between the petitioner and staff. We sort of arrived at a place to work comfortable. Um, we would seek guidance from the board if there were any additions or subtractions from the uh, BUD. Um, but again, the actual PUD outlines the zoning request, which is again going from the R1 to the R1A, R3, R4. Um, it would include the um, actual 
um, zoning ordinance and subdivision departures. Um, there was a portion of the of the PUD that I want to bring up for discussion in section five, which is a substitution policy, uh, which would allow the developer to substitute um, duplexes for single family homes and townhomes for duplexes in the, within those areas. Um, again, there would be no increase in actual density, but the, you would have the ability to substitute in certain areas. If there were in the R3 area, they could put single family homes in there. And in the R4 area, which which the counties and towns, they could do duplexes in there as well um, for the conditions that are outlined in the PUD itself. So I wanted to bring that up for discussion. Again, we were very clear that there was to be no increase in density from whatever number we agree upon or arrive on uh, for discussion. Uh, but I do want to bring that up as a point if anyone would like to discuss that. Mike, uh, Mike I'd like to, I was looking through this earlier and I couldn't find a net density figure for our general village, for the general area of the village itself. Uh, do you have that figure? We don't. We don't have one. We don't have uh, density requirements. And that density. We have the gross density, though. That's all. No, we don't. We don't have any density requirements in those. No, not requirements. Just what the figures are. Right? The existing figures. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually have to research that through the census data. I don't have that right now. Right now. Uh, before Mike wraps up this presentation, you gave some. You gave some. Uh, yeah, I did for the development. It was 7.92 for the development uh, for net density. And I think it was 3.4 for, right. for, the, for the gross density development. But I did give you a couple of examples. You compared that to, to some other right. areas in the building. Correct. For Reno Highlands and also to Country Cup Island States. But, we only, but using gross density figures, I, I didn't see a net density figure. Uh, which include all the other... Yeah, that's something I could look into. If you want me to look into it in the next meeting where we can just research I'm just it. Curious about it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, before we wrap up the presentation on the last slide, where Mike explains where, where this is going for discussion tonight and what their options are, I just want to go back real quick to the Planning Commission conditions. Uh, item number eight was requested that is the fire impact fee. I want to go a little bit deeper into that. So, typically, when we have an annexation agreement, we negotiate fees if they're not already in schedule, and sometimes we can deviate from that. Because this has already been annexed into North World, we're subject to basically the fee system that's already in our ordinances. Uh, the fire fee is an annexation fee, typically. So, by ordinance, we can collect a fee in lieu of land for the school district and an impact fee in lieu of land for the park district. Uh, in this case, I believe it will be the Fox Valley Park District. The fire district came at a request of the plan commissioner to, in, to offset impact fees. At the time, I don't think the, it was made clear to the plan commissioner, I'm just making sure the board is aware, that impact fee is not a general impact fee. It does not go to their, their basic operations or their functions. It can only be used for the land for a future um, purchase or building of a fire station or something on that lines because that follows state statute once again because it's not an annexation. So and Kevin did correct it. Right. I mean with the annexation agreements we can negotiate a more um, a fee that can be used for other things. Other you know, things other than the acquisition of land, but because the property's already tenants, we're limited to what the statute allows, which is land. <clears throat> is that the uh, conclusion of your presentation? No, I just a little bit more. Oh, good. Uh, a couple more items. <laughs> 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 Hold on, Mike. Uh, one more question on this slide: the substitution provisions. What is the? What would be the purpose of that? So that provision. Well, I, you know, Mark might be good, better sort of answer that question, but I believe if, if going through the phasing of the process, if they find that a certain um, product is uh, is more marketable or it actually just has more demand in the marketplace at that time, uh, because this is going to be done in phases, and it's going to uh, take a couple of years to develop this out, um, so it would be basically um, based on maybe more of a market demand. And Mark, I don't know if you have anything to sort of add to that. Yeah, uh, just disagree. I think one of the key learning things that uh, builders have learned through the downturn uh, as we've kind of come into this recovery is, you know, we, we don't always, you know, we can't create the market. Uh, the market is what the market is and we can serve the market. And so what we have found in, in QDs and, and applications similar to this is that uh, as the project progresses, you may be a year or two into it, and you realize that the demand is really more single family and that may be a duplex demand or a, a, a townhome product, uh, the, the shift or the market shift is to something different. 
And so what, what we've just found is it, it allows some flexibility uh, from us as a builder without increasing density, without going in for subdivision variances or changes, uh, but to adapt to a changing market to be able to provide uh, a product that would effectively down zone uh, in, in a different neighborhood. And so what we have tried to work or discuss with, with staff is how to protect the integrity of a subdivision. And so some of the restrictions within the PUD ordinance language that, that we have discussed is making sure that there's contiguity. So I couldn't just go into street E and throw in five single families and then have duplexes all around it. Uh, there would be basically a, an accountability system to make sure that in the event the market shift did say uh, that, that more single family units uh, you know, serve the market better, I would have to do it, or again, uh, if there's agreement within that language, uh, an organized structured event where I would have contiguity to that existing use uh, before that would be approved. So would it be a cap for our percent that, that could flip flop so we don't have? Well, again, you couldn't, we couldn't exceed, well, if, if they're proposing 374 units right now, you could not exceed that. Um, what that means is, is that you cannot put a duplex or a town in the single family um, zoning area. Uh, you could not put a town home in the R3 or the R1A area. So it would only be a down a downgraded density, so to speak, mm -hmm. but we would not allow them to exceed that um, overall unit threshold, if you will. Well, like you mentioned, it would change the look of the area. Well, I think for the R1, we did uh, clustering of six single family homes, so it would not be um, it deemed as being called spot zoning. We're putting, you know, you're not going to put a single family home in between a duplex um, unit or a town grouping. It would have to be a minimum of, um, I think we did six unit clusters for the single family unit. So, um, again, any change in plan that, that comes about, if it's within the zoning parameter, within the, this approval, would be subject to staff review anyways. Um, anything outside of this, if they wanted to do a duplex in the R1A area, or you know, if, if there was any um, deviation from the current zoning where they're proposing it, and the way they're proposing the units to be laid out in there, uh, would be considered to be a major change in plan, which would require full public hearing to come back before the planning commission to build forward to do this over again, um, to re-examine the plan. Right, I mean, we wouldn't want to see four more blocks of duplexes or whatever, even if they're selling water. Correct. So and that's why we, that's why Steph um, suggested required at some point that they were actually put the zoning layouts, because by, by right they could have requested a PUD and just called the whole entire PUD on R1 zoning, but then allowed more or less by, by, by definition or by uh, provision that allows certain types of uses in there. But in this case, we actually divided the development up by different zoning districts. So that way, uh, those units were subject to those specific areas. They weren't allowed to go outside of that. Um, some of the other information included in there, there's a signage package included as an exhibit um, in the PUD. The PUD agreement is very, very specific to the development. Uh, this gets into a lot of minutia of what happens afterwards if this were to be approved. Um, it talks about project phasing. Um, financial requirements and surety for um, any improvements that um, would need financial backing. Uh, the building codes, they're looking to lock in current building codes as they exist. Uh, they'd be subject to any state code amendments, um, building codes, energy codes. Um, but as far as the building codes go, they're they looking to actually lock in right now for a six year period for the 2009 um, International Code Series. Um, also, too, they've asked that um, the burning process be allowed to be to submit one master set. These are all new details and which staff is um, concurrent with uh, based on our internal processes. Um, a lot of what is, in, what is included in the PUD was requested to be extracted from the uh, bylaws. And these were brought up in discussion. We talked about density um, and those sorts of things at the planning commission level. The PUD, or the, actually the underlying HOA bylaws, um, they don't allow, um, with the exception of rear decks and patios for building additions, it doesn't allow for accessory buildings and structures on, um, on the residential lots, and have sheds, basketball goals, play equipment, things like that. Um, so again, being very restricted through design, what they can and cannot do on that property. Um, it also includes um, controls to what those fences that can be up on the property themselves, and includes um, also anti-monotony requirements uh, which typically the builder themselves would have in their development. Um, it, it just eliminates the redundancy in the model units and designs. So you don't have two next to each other. Um, that would be a requirement as well. Um, so again, 
the PUD is very, very specific to what the request is, what the votes will look like afterwards, um, and that would be the document that would come back before the village board for approval of the issue report. Now, this is just for future considerations. This is the last slide. Um, what we're looking to do is sort of wrap up with some of the parts here. And again, the, they're requesting a map amendment. They're requesting a special use of the um, We have conditions of approval that were from the Planning Commission, which are subject to change tonight based on the discussion. And um, also, too, there are, there are ways of looking at this in entirety. Um, there could be any comments with the should the village board want to proceed. Um, with any of the setbacks, with any of the zoning districts, the village board has the ability to make a comment to any of this. Um, you can accept everything that's been done as is. Um, you can reject or accept various portions of the plan, the PUD, the zoning. Um, you also have the right to um, add additional provisions uh, should you choose. So again, this is this is open for discussion. There's, there's open, open opportunity here to kind of go through what we provided, um, ask any questions, or provide any comments. Thank you. I have a question for Park. Uh, do you, in, in these type of uh, targeted developments, do you see uh, generally an, an increase in the need for like emergency services, fire, police, or you know medical emergencies or anything like that in these types of communities, as opposed to just a regular single-family residential subdivision? Um, I, I guess that the, the, we, we we have not done a, a, a study of that of that type of, of scenario. What I will say is, as we've looked at fiscal impact studies, the the permitting the, the revenue that's generated through the new new housing typically goes above and beyond and offsetting uh, that that increase. But uh, specific to your question, no, we've not we've done a data type of, of, of research to that. Uh, but yes, through fiscal impact studies and analysis, typically those impact fees, building permit fees, collectibles of, of revenue, uh, typically seem to satisfy uh, in the <coughs> increase in those services that the, that the village may anticipate. Well, if you allow me to give my opinion, it seems, I love the plane, and I uh, tell you that it, it's beautiful. Uh, my wife is there, I'm going to talk to her later on. <laughs> um, what I noticed with this situation, with, with this type of subdivisions, is that, uh, you know, a lot of the times, and you can correct me, Chief, if I'm wrong, you'll have perhaps calls that are, you know, uh, I found a suspicious vehicle parked here, can you come and check on it? Or perhaps, you know, I had a, a uh, somebody walking his dog and urinated in my yard. And, uh, you know, it's like you're not getting a lot of calls that are perhaps dangerous or, you know, uh, risky uh, uh, calls. But you do get your share of calls that are perhaps, you know, still need to be uh, dispatched and, 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 and investigated. And uh, now I just... That's exactly what I wanted, you know, to, to uh, take into consideration because, you know, again, we're adding a subdivision. We added the other subdivision in or Orchard Road, you know, with the condominiums, however, and as our uh, population grows, well, our need and uh, for other services, perhaps like fire departments and law enforcement, well, it, it's going to be impacted one way or another uh, with, with our, Risky calls or not risky calls, we still need to serve our, our people, right? So if we can go through and make a study or try to figure out uh, an, an average, you know, because we don't want to shorthand our, our police department or our fire department in any way because they're the ones that keep our, our families safe. You know, obviously, we're getting the additional taxes with this, so what goes along with that is our evaluation of what the requirements are. So I think that certainly is part of our future. But it's uh, to predict it right now is, I'd say, sort of impossible. And it's, again, it's going to be spaced out. So all of, no, they're not all going to be built the first year, and they're all not going to be moved into the first year. So it's totally tired. You have more presentation? I don't, but I do want to kind of tell is that even though we're you know just going through the planning process, there there's been a lot of preliminary engineering that's been done. Um, the village engineer has sat down with the fire chiefs and gone through turn templates and 
bridges from the different fire apparatus, um, and everything complies with that um, as well. So there, while well, there has not been a little discussion on studies about the impacts uh, financially on the district, they have had the ability to comment on the plan themselves, looking making sure that their apparatus has had the ability to effectively, um, you know, service any property within the It's safe to say there will be more police calls, and more ambulance calls, and hopefully no fire. Yeah. Oh, and what we'll, we'll we may be able to do is compare with other subdivisions. Oh, yeah. you know, I'm sure you probably, I mean, I'm sorry, Chief, uh, <laughs> perhaps the Chief can uh, uh, provide records of how many calls come through, you know, let's say Tanner Trails or some of the other subdivisions that have a similar number to the residents that the subdivision will have. I mean, none of those subdivisions are violent. In, in, in my opinion, you know, so, but, but we want to go through and make sure that all of our, our, our residents are, are, are served properly by all of our uh, services, right? So, uh, and, and get a good idea. Do you, do you feel that an increase in, in police calls or whatever would, would uh, negate us to booming this? Oh, absolutely not. I, I just want to make sure that everybody is, uh, you know, yeah. Like I said, I, I love I love the idea. I I, love, I really like the plan. I think the way we we talked about this, we got presentations. And we want to open up for our, uh, for those from the audience who wanted to speak, and then we would go through our discussion after that. So there are two people that signed up to speak, and maybe more of you would like to. Obviously, we don't want to repeat the same thing uh, that uh, with each individual. Uh, hopefully, the answers to all the questions that have been submitted or presented before in, the, in our previous meeting uh, or in our previous uh, uh, meeting of our planning group, that all those uh, questions have been answered. But for those who want to speak, Mike Kimball, please state your name and your address. Speak at the mic. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Kimball. Uh, I live at 584 Hammer Lane. Uh, North Aurora. Uh, I moved in in 2003. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm concerned about is some of the side lot uh, setbacks. Uh, I believe they were recommended by the Planning Commission, and I think that's still uh, kind of being discussed. Uh, I live in Banbury Ridge, uh, single family homes, and one of the things I really like is the openness of our subdivision. Uh, I chose North Aurora because of this, and I uh, bypassed a lot of other subdivisions. Uh, in other towns. Um, I also have uh, concerns about the traffic study, and uh, I think most people are utilizing other routes uh, through the subdivision, uh, mainly Sharon Lane and Pine Creek, and I don't think these are discussed in the traffic study. Um, so that were probably my big things that I don't see answered. Um, the other thing I'm concerned about is the density and um, pricing. I don't see any of the GIS uh, data in King County showing uh, that these houses will sell for high trees. That's all I've got. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jan, you can the vehicle. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, forget the age. Oh. <laughs> okay. I actually went and looked with my husband and some friends at your place in Pingree Grove. And we were pretty impressed with it. But one thing that we noticed was none of them had basements. Are basements going to be included in these houses? This short process clear. Do you want me to address questions on the fly? Yes, you can. can. Okay, can. Yeah, that would be fine. This is a direct. Yes. So yes, there will be a mix uh, because of the grading and the site conditions. Uh, there will be a mix of standard basements, uh, lookouts, walkouts, as well as some slab conditions. So there will be a mix of all foundation types. Okay, that was a kind of a deal breaker. If there wasn't basements, we weren't going to go any further. Um, <laughs> the other thing is. You talked about there being a pool at the clubhouse. Is there like an exercise room too, or? There is. Okay. So there's actually two 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 spaces within the clubhouse. Uh, one is kind of a flex room, and the other is like an exercise room. 
can decks be added onto the back of the houses? So typically, because all of the houses have a standard outdoor living area, whether it's covered or uncovered, there are restrictions as to sizes of decks or additions. A lot of that is regulated by the zoning district, uh, some of the FAR coverage, and so there, there won't be a lot of opportunity to add major expansions like that. So yes, the product is designed to have that space included to minimize uh, that, that other use. So can they be allowed? Yes. Would it be part of a review process through not only the HOA to make sure that the debt would be allowable? Yes, but it would also you know, have to go through the standard permitting process through the Village of North Aurora for that type of issue. Um, and the trees. You're talking about taking down big trees and putting in smaller trees. You're talking about 55 and older. We want to be around to see them. The trees develop, so you're not going to put in these little spindly trees, right? Sure. So, right, obviously, <laughs> the, the, the intent is to save as many trees, mature trees, as we can. Um, I think the realization, as you look at the site, and again, I know I always kind of go back to the answer of engineering, um, but the the amount of fall as you get from the north moving down to the south, uh, it is quite a bit, over 20 to 25 feet, if I remember correctly. So the intent absolutely is to save as many mature pockets areas. Uh, what is driving some of that protection area is final site grading, final engineering. And so yeah, to your point, uh, our current proposal or, you know, or discussion with staff and, and kind of the recommendation we've taken at this point is to look at a replacement program to where that if I've got a 10-inch caliper tree, I'm replacing it with you know trees that at a minimum, you know, equate to that 10 inch caliper. So what is that two, five inches, right? So again, I think as a part of that uh, protection preservation plan as it evolves, um, I think some of those details, uh, you know, come out, I think, through the final engineering and the review of that final plan. But absolutely the intent would be to save as many clusters of mature trees as possible, because that is what gives the site some unique Really, use. yeah. Absolutely. And I also live in that Sanbury Ridge subdivision, and I'm an original owner of that subdivision. So we've watched our trees grow for 17 years. So. Um, and finally, when are you breaking ground, and when is your move-in time frame? Well, I always hate to be presumptuous in this answer, but um, as we work through this process, assuming that there is uh, the, the want and the, the uh, a recommendation to continue to move forward. Uh, it would be our desire to start moving, doing earthwork, mass grading uh, this fall, and be able to uh, effectively have a model open uh, for the spring market of next year. And you're looking for people to move in within as soon as we can sell six months. <laughs> yeah. so, so typically, uh, from from the point of you know start of foundation to the completion of the home, uh, depending on weather and conditions, that could be a four to five yeah. month period from the sale to the closing. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So we got a deal, ma'am? We got what? <laughs> so we got a deal, ma'am? Well, we're going to negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Yes, please. State your name and address. She didn't say your name. Well, I had her name. Right, okay. I forget the age. I live in 373 Ridge Road. I want to go back to the trees. Is the developer intending, are these going to be tree lined streets? No, they aren't, are they? Are you asking, are there, are there standard parkway trees that will be planted? Absolutely. Yes. Oh, there are? Yes. Okay, and so there's a regular, how, how wide is the parkway? I mean, some of the neighborhoods around here. Sure. The sidewalks are right at the street, so. Sure. Do you know? Sir, do you know the actual dimension of the parkway? I'm going to relay my tactic. From memory, it's a 60 foot right away with a 27 back to back, and approximately 5 foot sidewalk. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
why would you do, you know, why wouldn't, why, maybe can you break up the monotony in the, in the duplexes also? Does anybody agree with me? Well, you saw the uh, presentation of, the, of what did. they look like. Well, I know, but the town, but the duplexes are more monotonous. Facade. No, no, they have roof lines that, that change, and I think well, it's... Well, but that's not a I mean, we're talking about house, 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 house. <coughs> not broken up by any pieces of land in between. Oh, like the triplexes are. Am I, at, am I correct about that? No. Uh, I, I, I would say you no, would but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Is it possible to pull up uh, our initial... Our, uh, so, uh, yeah, we're going to do that right now. Before I can address that. I'm just making a comment myself. I'm just making a comment. I'm not demanding otherwise, but I'm making a comment. <laughs> well, my, I think now that when they put something together, you know, there's a lot of things in consideration when it comes down to the planning, the fin financial expenses on perhaps, you know, dedicating every building to be completely different if you i'm not asking for the buildings to be different i they did a nice job in putting empty space between the triplexes it wasn't on the original <coughs> three three houses oh, together yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. no yeah that's what it's called it's a few flat i'm sorry i'm with Look, look, look. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing in between. But, no, these are the duplexes. So, for example, uh, some of your to directly answer. Um, part of the priority.
which is right about here, they removed that. That was put there because all this area floods when it rains on that property. They specifically put that pond in there. Now that pond is going to be filled. So that could cause uh, major issues. And especially, too, all the water from here, 240 acres, all comes through right here. Yeah. And so it's going to come through here. And I noticed, too, most of the open space is water retention. It's not going to be very usable uh, for the residents. It's going to be water retention. Um, so that could cause an issue for any of these homes that are on slabs. They will flood. Um, and I noticed, uh, I, would, I watched many of the uh, village board meetings on, on TV. And uh, on one, I think last week or week before, there was already some issues up, I think, by the property of um, Marmion and uh, Winfield Drive up there. Some properties there are flooding uh, due to some issues. So I want to know if uh, there are issues with this property, let's say three, four, five years from now, who pays for those, uh, you know, uh, redeveloping the, uh, those uh, properties or those issues? Um, have you figured out the uh, warranties? I had asked about warranties for what the homes will have. You weren't able to answer that at the last meeting. Um, open space seems to be mostly uh, retention. Route 25 buffer is most of it. Um, and I would like to see if you could show a, a picture from Route 25, how the property looks. Is it going to be retention and then up and then property? There's really been no issues of how it's going to look when you drive down Route 25. You're going to look um, right at a wall of uh, water or a wall of grass, or how is that going to look? Um, across from a runaway, this was uh, many years ago, they uh, proposed a development in townhomes there, and it used to be an old nursery. So a lot of mature, beautiful trees. They said they were going to save as many as they could. They saved five, um, and half of those have already died. Um, on Route 25, uh, many times I've almost been hit head on by somebody passing on that road. Now, if somebody's heading uh, south on Route 25 and somebody passes them and somebody's turning right out north, there will be head on collisions there. Um, Fire Department Rep. Mark Bozak, a part of the Planning Commission, said the density of this uh, R1A and everything would uh, increase the uh, uh, attendably increase the uh, activity for the fire department by 60% over normal regular R1 development. So that will cost everybody more money in the village. Um, I do like um, that uh, Taylor mentioned about more of, of uh, maybe a fine and sodium mark for the trees because again the development uh, developments that I've seen uh, one that was, uh, I think it was in Batavia, they actually tore down the trees on Arbor Day and literally cleared cut everything. Nothing was saved. Nobody was there to supervise the um, people that were uh, doing the tree demolition. Um, what else? Oh, also, um, on a uh, previous development for Fairway View, um, they required them to make this curved road because originally it was a straight road. This is a drag strip. This is a drag strip. It's all too straight. They made this curve and they made them put spaces in between like the one made them put and put this here. This was never there. It was going to be solid buildings, building, 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 buildings. They made them make all these extra spaces so they balanced out with the surrounding properties where there's more space in between the buildings. So I, maybe that could, there could be more done in some of these that you're, they're literally, you're five, six feet apart. It's a wall, it's like barracks. All right. um, so I'm gonna limit you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to limit you to your <coughs> comments. Okay, okay. is that, how much, how much more do you have? Just a few. I just, there's just some things that weren't addressed on some of the nine points, some of the conversations we had. Bring it up the, the road you're talking about was the internal road in that development. It wasn't owned by the village of North America. No, no. The village made the developer yeah, do the road. It wasn't owned place. by the village then. So no, I, I, never, I never said it was owned, but the village made them make this road curve. Okay. The builder made the right. builder do that. Well, come on, don't let it finish. 
Yeah, I don't know why I'm being pushed out. I could go on for. Uh, well, because you're saying the same thing that you said before. Mm -hmm. But then they weren't addressed by the developer. All right. If I'm asking again, they were not. The, the developer did about an eight minute presentation. There was a four hour meeting. There were a lot of questions. I know you already covered a lot of the nine points, but there were a lot of other ones that weren't addressed. Um, and again, I have some knowledge in, uh, in this industry. I've been doing this for over 30 years. Um, my family's built over 7,000 homes in the Fox Valley area, over 1,000 in North Aurora. Um, so I have a, a, a state uh, a representation of uh, what could be done for the community. Um, all the developments, again, are not 374. There's about 70 buildable acres on that property with all the easements. Um, and the setbacks and all that um, in the open space. Our neighborhood has 72 acres and there's only 190 residents. So it just shows you the, the high, high density um, issue that we'll, we'll have uh, with the property. Um, I think that might be it. Oh, and also the, uh, the developer mentioned uh, age targeted the last meeting and he kind of switched it in the presentation of active community, um, which maybe you know, they've done a little more research, but basically that is the new business plan for developers to fit more residences on pieces of property. That's all it is. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, sir. I, um, yes. I'm just a public servant, right? right. I, uh, I'm, I'm here. All of us here are here to serve you, and uh, we have a great team. But um, this is not a deal. I would like to see, perhaps, you would like to set up a meeting with some other people that have an interest. I would like to set an individual meeting with you, and uh, perhaps we can go through and work the area, go through some other planning. Because yeah, one of the main things was the density in that they didn't do anything to the density. Correct. You know, yeah. I, 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 just, I, just, right. I, we I would like yeah. to hear all of your concerns. Right. 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 I think you're out of order. Am I? Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, I think it's good. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for your time. You know, I'd like to share a word just to. Uh, I uh, had the same. Concerns the gentleman had, and still have somewhat concerns. But this weighs to a certain degree by the fact that the style and the whole atmosphere of the uh, total project kind of lends itself to, to allow for a more dense population, I believe. Uh, the individuals by that uh, aren't going to want to mow their lawns. And, you know, that, so I think that it might fit. Uh, 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 I'm not, where, where's the gentleman? Uh, I think that the uh, I live very close to the to the project myself. Right, you live in my neighborhood. Yes. Yes. And uh, I, I was concerned with that the same issue, but I, I really believe that the style and design and the whole purpose of the pro total project does lend itself to a little bit more of a density than what we uh, <coughs> normally uh, enjoy here in North Aurora. Right. But it's not an R1. Right. It's certainly not that it's not like our 40,000 square foot pots. It's a it's it's a different environment. So you have to look at it. Right. You can't compare it to a single family residence that are built on a quarter of an acre or a lot or half a lot. It's we're talking about a different different thing. So let's look at it for what it is and not what we all would maybe think we'd like to see there, but it's not going to happen. Yeah, uh, well, I'm on the same page as you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just have one, one last thing. My parents do live in a uh, similar community, and you have to propose one pool. That will not work for the residents. Um, they have actually a satellite pool and a separate pool, so when grandkids come, the residents are not disturbed by splashing kids, so they actually have separate pools, um, one for residents and one for residents with grandkids and company that comes. So that might be an issue you might want to address because that will deter uh, people from buying if there's only one pool. Right. Thank you. Well, it's funny we talk about trees, and uh, I've been, been in my house for over 50 years with trees that I planted then, and they're now 70 foot tall and dying. So they happen, you know, it goes with time. And uh, 
so we'll look for that same thing to happen no matter where you want to get to I'm a Jericho lead on one Ridge Road. And I agree, just agree with the guy that too much density and with what you're saying that it lends itself to that, it looks like that, and because there's townhomes and duplexes involved, it can't look better. But on Ridge Road, we look a lot better. And people come down Ridge Road, and they know what they all say? This is great. It's a really nice townhomes. They're well cared for. There's space in between. You've got the curved road. You don't have people flying <coughs> through their own runways. So I just really would hope that you know the members here would look at this density again a little closer. We know they're not all single family. We know that it's not all single family home, no. but it can be done better than this. I believe. One question I back to the trees because we're all concerned about that. I know that all the trees have been counted and marked out on the property, and you're talking about taking a certain amount of them. You know, obviously they're going to come down with construction. Do you know how many trees have been marked? And with the plan as it is, how many for sure are going to be taken out? Or a percentage? 20%, 40%, 50%? I, and, and no, I, I don't have a percentage to, to that detail. Um, yes, the trees have been tagged and evaluated for uh, quality. Sure. Uh, but that, I believe, has been, and I, I may, I may jump back to, to Rich on this. Uh, from that, the intent would then be that that tree count specimen type uh, right, would then be incorporated into it with the tree protection preservation. But if you, if you had to say, do you think I, you're going to say I, half I, of them? Or? I, I, I personally can't answer that, Rich. I don't know if you've got a we have read the landscape plan, original smoke area, whatever it is. Um, we're still evaluating, it's not a final plan yet. And of course, we're looking at final grades to see what we can do. We've got several pockets throughout that we're going to be saving. Uh, it's my understanding there's approximately 800 or so trees that we've looked at. Um, the majority of them are species that are very undesirable. So a lot of those trees that are of yeah. uh, desirability are not, you know, are not really, mm -hmm. we don't want to save them. Um, but we're going to be planting approximately 1,200, 1,500 trees. So we're going to be planting a lot of trees as part of the new development. So there's going to be a combination of preservation work camp. Um, we're going to look at the quality trees in those areas and try and save those. And we're going to replace with a lot of trees on the development. Yeah, we have a tree inventory in their packet of 2,500 trees, and, and they're assessed as to their condition, whether they're good, bad, or different, and uh, whether they should be saved or saved. Are you saying from the 2,500 that there are yeah. about 800 yeah. that are worthy right. of saving? Yeah. Well, we're saying, not saying that those 2,500 are worth saving. No, that's what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, whether you're going to take the 2,500 down to the 800? Right. I mean, we're still looking through the, the final details of that, and we're going to make sure. I don't want to, you know, on record say exactly what it is, but the trees that we're looking at saving um, are in specific pockets that will allow for grading. Uh, we also have buffer areas that are throughout the site. You've got the north buffer, the east buffer, and the south buffer, and there's trees along those buffers that we're going to save as part of the development as well, um, as well as um, along the uh, river. Street buffer, we're going to try and see the pockets there too. If we bring up a plan, I can show you, but um, to give you an exact number, we'll certainly lock that down as we move forward. Um, as far as the pockets, one last question, Mr. President, Village President. Um, with these pockets, and my concern in particular is Ridge Road, because that's where I'm at, but for all of us, as we go along that, that edge, and I'm going to be behind duplexes. So I've got the wall of product that's being built there. Within those trees, there is a lot of, I'm going to call them weeds <laughs> and wheat trees and you know whatever else is growing in there. But they are creating a pretty nice buffer. And I used to keep my area kind of cleared out so I could have the, the fairway view of the golf course. Now I've kind of let it go. Is it the plan to, 
Are you gonna, and I know that most of those trees and bush are on your property. On, or, you know, once yeah, you know, that, are, are you planning to clean that all out, or well, are you just going to let that go? Well, uh, I, I think what you're saying is, is a very good uh, assessment that we're still looking at. It, it's one thing from a horticultural standpoint to have a specimen of trees. There's also trees, shrub areas that that might serve a purpose. Yes. We're, we're still looking at that as part of the plan. If you look at the eastern edge of property, You'll see that on um, the same way. If you drive yeah, it down, exactly. you're going to see that a lot of scrap in there, right? So there's a trick there, and we're going to be looking at that. The, the, and it's not really a trick; it's just how you want it to look. Do you want that to be clean right. and have a nice new buffer, or do you want to try and preserve some of that? You, somebody might say scrub area, just to put a good buffer on it. Put it in. Right. It's right. From Banbury, I don't know that it would be a great look as far as you're going to have two entries from Banbury. But so along the north and the south, maybe because we're looking at the backs of the corners. Right, right. So, I mean, and, and that's a great point because along Banbury, you have that condition. We're still evaluating what the best approach is for that because a, a green wall might be the best way to go. Um, but then there's the concern about the uh, maintenance of those uh, of those right ways from the village standpoint, they own them and they're, sh they're shrub planting within sure. the right They're out there trimming them, you know, and they want to keep them. So same thing is happening on the southern boundary of the townhome area. There's the existing trees that are there, as well as a mix of uh, other trees, stuff. other stuff that's gone. So I think there's a, a balance there that we're going to have to make sure it makes sense for buffering and preservation. Would, and then, would, would the plan be just if the scruff comes out, would you then add the pine trees or the yeah, to try to buffer that up? That's exactly then? what we have right now as a plan on, on the southern boundary as well as the eastern boundary. If we're saving the shrub area, scrub area, if you want to call it, then we're going to supplement those areas. But where it's open, we're going to buffer that uh, with the new plantings that are going to be heavy. <coughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Sir, before you sit down, could I get your last name and then your address on the road? Uh, K A L I T A, Kalita, uh, 367 Ridge Road. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Ed Swing, I live 606 Five West Court in Foxconn. I think a couple of states adjacent to this property. And I just want to make a comment on a couple of things, and I think as a neighbor, uh, I share a lot of the concerns that we've heard both in the planning commission meeting and also here tonight. Um, and we all want this to be great. We want it to look great, we want the approach to be great. But the reality is that the density is not a relevant conversation, in my opinion. This is a different product. As a realtor, and I work primarily with seniors and people downsizing, we desperately need this product. And not just in North Aurora, but in the entire community area. Um, one of the greatest attributes of any municipality is diversity of housing. And that's something that we don't have here. So I'm looking forward to this. Um, I'm looking forward to it being, you know, all the considerations and concerns being addressed in one way or the other. But I do think it's high to best use. And I applaud the airport for the uh, adjustments they've made with respect to the staff's comments. Thank you. Thank you. Ed, I thank you for your comment. I was thinking the same thing. I think when we're comparing densities of other pockets in the village, you're comparing apples to oranges. This is, we have to be careful that we're comparing apples to apples. There are other communities like this in the state of Illinois. You know, there's Del Webb communities up in Huntley and Shorewood that those are more characteristic of the type of development that this is. There is very limited senior housing in this area, not senior targeted, 55 and over housing, however you want to call it. They don't, like the mayor said, they don't want to mow their lawns. They don't want to shovel their snow. All of those amenities are included in this development. They don't want the half acre lots. So to compare those, to make those comparisons is unfair uh, to this development. Um, and is it, you know we'll see with the pricing and stuff, but but the tax revenue to the village is huge um, because they're not going to use the school 
and they're not going to use a lot of the services they will use fire police um, and other you know maintenance type services but like the mayor said that should be included in the tax base that this is going to generate so I, I agree with you I'm very excited to see this development come because uh, it will add rooftops to the village a lot of the complaints that I hear throughout the village since I've been on, in the planning commission and then on the village board is we need restaurants, we need you know businesses. Well, businesses only come when there's rooftops, and when there's people and there's foot traffic. This development adds that to the village and adds a vibrant uh, base to spend money in the village, to you know buy cars in the village, to eat in the village. So. I, I, I am excited to see this development. Thank you. I think it's been a very, very worthwhile meeting, and uh, obviously, I think the staff and DR Hart has done a great job of addressing those things that were presented in the prior meetings. I think it's, a, uh, it's great that we can come together with, a, with ideas, and solutions. Just for a point of clarification on a couple of things. Um, the, again, the condition of the staff board, of course, the planning commission with the 10 foot setbacks. Um, uh, more more feedback as to whether the board concurs with that or going with as proposed at five feet for the R1A district. Um, also, too, there's a lot of discussion about tree preservation. This was one of staff's main concerns. Um, over a year ago, we first had conversations with the developer. And you can see the chronology of the um, actual plans up there. This is directly from the Planning Commission hearing. Um, again, it shows more of a grid, grid pattern where we grew linear and designing around the tree clusters themselves, uh, primarily up to 25 and certain clusters on the north and the south there, uh, primarily a large block along the south. But one of the things that um, we discussed too is there's been a lot of discussion about the trees and preserving them. If you want to move, the condition could be that um, fines and caliber replacement could be added as a condition. I mean, I'm just looking for a little more direction to move back to the PUD with um, if we bring it forward the next meeting for consideration. That's you know, I think those things go along with the final design and, and the layout of the roads and everything else. So, I, you know, I think it's, I don't know if it's far enough along for that type of thing, but that certainly can be, a, can be addressed. What I want to know is from, our, from the board this evening that uh, is there anything that uh, was not presented or has not been presented or that had been presented that uh, would make you feel that you're not in favor of this project? I would just like to say that I, you know, we've been on this project for over a year now and I'd like to say I, I'm very appreciative that you've been so easy to work with and that you've know, taken our concerns and our feedback and you've worked with us. I'm all for approval of the concept. I think it's a great fit for the village, and um, you know I concur with everything Mark has said about it's a great product. It's not to compete directly with other single-family homes. It's a different type of product, and it's desperately needed. And I think mean, honestly, I, I've been in real estate for 20 years. I think it's going to do great. Any other comments? I agree. I agree. Um, I've moved to uh, three different houses in North Aurora, and I started with a. Uh, 900 square foot and work my way up and at some point I might want to work my way down. And, you know, we love our community, everybody here does, you know, and I, and I certainly appreciate your concerns, um, but it is desperately needed, I think, and if you want, you know, uh, I want to see a community and maybe downsize to where I don't shovel my snow or cut my grass, this would be a great option. You know, someone's going to go in there. Um, I know we're all concerned with water and, and uh, just everything, but I think uh, you know with staff's work and, and uh, this company, as Laura said, I mean they really work with uh, all pretty much all the concerns. Um, I'm sure they'll address some of these other ones tonight. So I I think it's a uh, it's a nice positive thing for the village. So. You know I can't think of anything that's developed in the village over the last sixty years that I've been here that didn't at some point in time come up with a problem that. Uh, that we addressed and fixed. And then we brought up the one on, uh, on the east side on uh, 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 Beebe and, and our connection with, uh, with the uh, uh, Marmion. 
that, yeah, there's a problem that uh, we need to solve, and, uh, and we're working on solving it. So it's like everything else. When those things develop, and they don't seem to develop right overnight. You know, here we're talking about a subdivision that's been there 20, 30 years, and, and things are changing. So but we address them when they come up. So then good. Any other comments? I'm with Brian. All right. Okay. Uh, you, you did an excellent job of presenting all this stuff to us. Uh, Ma'am, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for expressing uh, and bringing all your opinions. Thank you for your interest in investing in our, in our village. I mean, we really appreciate it. And uh, I, uh, I'm learning my way here, so I, I, uh, I apologize if I was not aligned in any way by issuing the card. Um, but I want to help, and we all do, so, uh, um, thank you. Very good. Hey, anyone? Yeah, I was just uh, talking about the only thing that, before this moves forward, so it sounds like the board wants to move this forward uh, for approval for the uh, upcoming board meeting. With that being said, the plan commission conditions that are in front of you, I need to know, and I need to know if those are set the way you want them. So, this would be the time on that tree. If you want to leave it the way it is, leave it the way it is. If you want to change it, it should be changed now so it's in the final order. I think I'll change it. So, yeah, that's uh, fine. You know, the, most of the conversation is nobody really knows it's a moving target on any of these trees, so right now I don't even know. Let's come up with some alternatives that we can discuss. Right? Mike and I both agree that we can come up with a combo. All right. And then, you know, then we'll do that. So it's not, obviously, we're not going to vote wrong. Well, and I would like to see a plan for the number of trees that are there now and the, the, the estimate of trees that they plan on preserving uh, the, uh, throughout the whole development and, and, and then work from there. If those are the trees that they plan on preserving, if they knock down 20 of those, uh, are those the ones that we're talking about fines or are we talking about uh, on the whole point by hundreds? They obviously have to, when they're afraid, they don't think they have trees right. that are but so it'd be the ones that they said they are going to preserve. Yeah, what's in the package is a tree preservation plan, and it's, it's a bubble set plan that includes all the, as of right now, the trees that are being preserved. Uh, there, are, there are several hundred trees that are there. <coughs> if you look in your packet, you'll see the, the actual listings of trees, the species, the condition, and again, the, the plan right before that is bubble plan and includes all the trees that are being to be preserved. This is from the plan committee trying to reach. I had it up earlier, but if you if you remember that um, cluster, but here are the number of trees that were tagged. Twenty five hundred. This is the current preservation plan um, that um, staff has been working with uh, with the developer. So there is a plan that um, has been in place. Again, this is just a tree preservation plan. Uh, the landscape plans for development are also included in the package as well. Um, that have been thoroughly reviewed by staff and um, staff consultants. Well, certainly we move them to have to keep the big trees because that certainly adds uh, value to the first looking out the back window. But I guess that Ridge Road and the North End would be my concern that, that you know, either that they work around and design some things around what's there versus hey, we're going to cut all these down and put you. Some of those trees on Ridge Road are on our property, not, not their property. Okay, so well, they're, you know, there's. There's all kinds of things to go into consideration. I, I, I do want to take just a brief minute to gloat for a second, if I could. Uh, right now, in our current design and engineering, uh, we're spending about a half a million dollars in retaining walls to protect trees. And so as we look at replacements and caliper sizing, and again, amenable to a structure that the village is happy with, whether that's a replacement or a percentage of fine or, or how we get there. Um, but but I, I, I don't want to underestimate the, I guess I want to make sure that I am highlighting uh, that our engineers and our landscape architects uh, are really looking hard and fast as how to protect trees to, to the extent of, of, like I said, about a half a million dollars in retaining walls and then right maintenance and the ability to construct those in a way where we don't have problems to protect trees. So it is important to us. I don't want to minimize uh, that discussion. Uh, as Mike said, it's been you know discussion that's been ongoing from the very beginning. Uh, so we will continue to look for those opportunities. And, and, and if I need to agree to you know a combination of a replacement or a fine, uh, however however the village board is comfortable with, uh, absolutely we would try to accommodate the best I could. Very good. Thank you. When we're done, I'd like to speak to the people of the bridge. I have something I'd like to show you.
<laughs> Is there anything else we need to talk about? I didn't understand a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We're out of here. I'm going to show you how to do it.